So how to write a high quality resolution. Um, first, what is a resolution? Well, it's really just a written proposal that asks Misney to take a position. And you can put Misney, you can take Misney out and put in AMA. You can put it in any sort of specialty society, any sort of organization uh, within medicine. I'm sure other fields also have very similar things um, are based off a of policy. And these proposals are how you change those policies. So you can really take this to the bank and use it anywhere that you're doing any sort of actually work with an organized medicine organization. Uh, it empowers individuals or groups um, to drive actions of the entire organization. So if students have things that they really care about regarding medical school, you know, they can get the entirety of this need to go uh, fight for those things because a lot of um, states work differently. It's not always a national picture. Um, there's a New York Department of Education, and they regulate a lot of what happens in, in medical schools. And same thing for different states. So it's not always about big national change. There's a lot within state legislation and state policies that affect uh, how medicine works and training for medicine works. And then um, if it gets passed, as I said in the previous talk, the shape the policy and then Disney goes off and tries to implement that policy um, however they see best to, to manage that. Um, you all saw this before, um, but this is how resolution becomes policy. Again, uh, an individual can write a resolution or you can get a group of people to write a resolution to help out um, with the different parts of it. And then you bring that resolution to your section or in MISNI, actually, you can uh, submit it as an individual as well. Um, but uh, generally having section support is pretty helpful and I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, and then once it goes from the section, it gets submitted to the HOD, or as I said, you could submit it as an individual to the HOD. The House of Delegates, which is uh, all the voting members that represent the different sections and groups of folk um, <clears throat> will then vote on it on whether to make it policy or not. And there's a few extra steps in there that I will get to later as well. And then once it becomes policy, then the leadership lobbyists and staff go in and run with it. And then as you uh, all heard earlier um, from uh, Mo Oster's talk that uh, there's a lot of results that come out of those policies. So um, right now, well, I've got to change the title of it, um, is checking current policy is really the first step. And again, you can change out that AMA with MISNI. And uh, that is the correct link, however. Um, so you start off and you want to say, oh, I want to make this policy. Well, make sure that it's not already on the books. Um, because if it's already on the books, then it's a lot easier. You don't need to go through any sort of voting process. Um, you can go off and talk to leadership and say, hey, this is a policy that I don't think Misney's paying enough attention to. Um, but the, the first step is going to the Misney Digest, um, the Misney uh, position statements, and that has all the different policies that Misney is using as the foundation of how they determine to support uh, XYZ bills or not support XYZ bills. And same thing with when different departments ask MISNI for advice or what MISNI's position on XYZ changes. Um, because, you know, New York has a Department of Health and <clears throat> MISNI works with all these different aspects of the government, not just the legislation. Um, and uh, if you submit a resolution that um, is already covered by current policy, then uh, that's not really adding value and it probably won't get passed uh, through the house because folks will say, oh, we're already doing that. Um, <clears throat> and then um, you can always look at the past meeting and see the actions of the house there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, because that will help you understand what is tried to be passed, what didn't pass. Um, and 
you know, if you have a policy that's exactly the same as some that didn't pass, it's unlikely to get uh, passed the second time around. So maybe some changes need to be made. Uh, some other folks need to be talked to to figure out why it didn't get passed. Um, <clears throat> I feel like I deleted this slide. Um, I must be showing the wrong slideshow. That's all. Let me. Sorry, all. Let me open up the right slideshow. Uh, technical difficulties. Okay, yeah, here we go. Got got the right <clears throat> uh, policy on here. All right. Um, again, you can talk to your section leadership and counselor um, <clears throat> to make sure that it's brought up at the next leadership meeting uh, to determine that uh, a policy is being paid attention to and that MISD can take actions on it if it's already existing policy. Um, so there's a couple different parts of a resolution. The first part is the title. And as you know, all of you have passed through some sort of undergrad uh, biology program, you know that a title should be succinct and it should state the main issue. Same thing with a resolution. Um, <clears throat> make sure it's sort of grabby and nicely envelops what you're trying to do with the resolution. Uh, and then authors, you know, pretty self-explanatory there. Um, these authors can be individuals. Um, they could be sections uh, such as RFS, MSS, YPS, um, the different counties and different districts. All those different folks can be sponsors and co-authors. Then there's the sort of meat of the resolution, which is the whereas clauses. And this is all your background info and rationale. Um, they all start with whereas and end with end. Um, and this is all backing up why you want to do what you want to do. Um, these do not get put into policy um, because then our, our policy companion would just be insanely long um but they back up on why uh the next part of the resolution should be become policy and the next part of the resolution is the resolved clauses this is what you want to become policy this is the new position statements uh this is what you want misney to do um and so this is sort of a uh a blank totally unwritten in resolution, how it would look like. Um, so the introduced by would be the authors, the subject would be the title, um, and the referred to is a reference committee, which I'll get to what a reference committee is later on. Uh, and then you'll have several whereas clauses saying, whereas residents are always hungry because they're always working, and whereas residents don't get paid enough so they can't afford food, and uh, whereas residents are almost always in the hospital, um, those are all your backup statements, your background, and why it's important. Therefore, be it resolved that Disney should support free meals whenever residents are working in the hospital. And so that resolved clause is saying, I want Disney to advocate for residents getting free food when they're in the hospital. That's what I want Disney to do. I want Disney to bring that to the legislation, um, bring that to whatever departments are in charge of <clears throat> um, getting free food for residents, maybe the Department of Health, so on and so forth. And that's what I want Ms. Nee to do. And then as with any uh, well-researched topic, you should always have references, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, backing up what you have, therefore, you have good, strong references. These could be studies. These could be news articles. They don't need to be peer-reviewed exactly, but they should have some uh, merit to them. 
And then it's nice to always have some existing Disney policy. Um, so if there's policy that's related to it, but doesn't directly address it, that is also generally listed to the show like, hey, I did my research. I looked at the current policy statements and I don't think they cover what I want Disney to do. I did a whole lot of talking. Does anyone have any questions so far? All right, doesn't look like it. I don't see any hands raised or anything. Great, okay. So um, again, uh, whereas clauses, breaking it down, it's where you build your rationale. Um, technically, each whereas clause should be one sentence, um, which uh, can be pretty long when you start using semicolons and colons and things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> but each one should be one sentence and there's no limit to the amount of whereas clauses you can have. And then, as I said before, your whereas clauses should each have a uh, citation, have good merit, uh, meritable re references um, <clears throat> that can be relied upon and that you're not just trying to pull someone's leg to get personal gain or something. Not that any of us would do that, of course. Um, and then the whereas clauses should also uh, enforce why is this a Disney issue? Um, why should the Medical Society of State of New York care about X, Y, Z? Um, we should care about it because it's affecting New York residents as far as my uh, free lunch residents uh, resolution goes. Um, so that's where the whereas clauses are. <clears throat> and then the resolved clauses, which are the substance that becomes policy that Disney acts on um, should stand by itself in both grammar and content. And each clause should be unambiguous. Um, so it shouldn't be something as broad as Disney should help residents. That's extremely broad and doesn't help guide anyone anywhere. Um, so it should be unambiguous like Disney should advocate for free meals while residents are in the hospital, right? That's not very ambiguous. It doesn't state exactly how they should go about it. So it leaves them some room to move around, but it's very easily known what the goal is. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, I'll get to the verbiage a little bit later um, because when I use the word like advocate, it's different than if I use a word such as support or and then that's very different than if I use a word like oppose um, and I have a slide that kind of goes over that a little bit later on. Um, <clears throat> and then um, <clears throat> again, this sort of just kind of sums up what I was saying before that the tent should be specific. Disney should know what we want from the resolution, from the resolve clause, and so that they don't need to kind of scratch your head and like, okay, what was the author really want to do with this? This is the verbiage I was referencing uh, to before. Um, and there's a few different words that resolved clauses generally include. And advocate is one of the, <clears throat> these are all um, used pretty often. So um, advocate generally has a strong action. It's you want lobby money spent to do X, Y, Z. Um, <clears throat> and that's different than collaborate slash work with other appropriate stakeholders. So if I want uh, resolved that our MISNI work with the Department of Education and the Department of Health to ensure that students and residents get free food while they're at the hospital. Um, so I'm asking MISNI to work with a couple different departments um, and possible other stakeholders. You know, uh, maybe they should work with AMSA to work with this if we're going to include medical students um, or the, the New York uh, Medical Student Society <coughs> um, <clears throat> to, to get this work done. Um, and then that's, of course, different than if I want MISNI to create materials slash programs. Um, and then, you know, so on and so forth. I think a lot of these are, are kind of self-explanatory, but the verbiage you use do have different. Like advocate is different than support. 
Um, and then the rest of these little action words sort of describe where Misney should go with each of them. Any questions on the verbiage? I know it could be a little bit nitpicky and a little bit confusing if you haven't really seen um, resolutions before. Okay, cool. All right, so um, <clears throat> here's uh, an example. Um, whoops, uh, let me go back here. Um, you saw the blank resolution and you can actually download that off of Misney's website and uh, you can replace the top with anything you want to whatever organization because most organizations use that exact format uh, whenever they're doing any sort of resolution work. Um, and then, <clears throat> so you format your resolution. So it looks like the sample on the right here and you submit that draft resolution for uh, Misney um, for our HOD in April. Uh, we're still working on uh, who the ultimate uh, receiver of the draft is. Um, if I'm not correct, I think we have some staff that can correct me if I'm wrong on that account. Um, but your section staff members are a good source to figure out where your draft resolution should go. Um, <clears throat> And then you can also just spread your draft resolutions to, to other folks like, hey, what do you think about this resolution? Should I change anything about the whereas clauses? Should I change anything about the resolved clauses? What do you think? Um, <clears throat> and you can also send it to different sections saying, hey, I would really appreciate this section's uh, support for this resolution. And then their section will, will go and vote on it and determine on if they like it how it is, if they have any changes they wanna make on it. And if they approve it, then they can become a co-author or co-sponsor for the resolution. And then you can submit the, the final resolution again to generally the, the staffers of the sections. After it's submitted, it then goes to something called a reference committee. And a reference committee is a group of experienced members um, who then provide recommendations for each resolution um, that gets submitted to the HOD. And MISNI has a couple of different reference committees. Each of their focuses on a different subject, such as um, government affairs or public health or medical education. And so each of those committees are built up of experienced members in those areas. <clears throat> um, and their recommendations could be something like adopt the resolved clauses, uh, which means the REFCOM thinks that the resolution is great how it is, the resolved clauses are clear, um, and it's an important thing to work on, <clears throat> and we don't want anything to be changed at all. Um, the opposite of that, of course, is not adopt, which means uh, we don't, you know, the REFCOM doesn't think that this pertains to uh, MISNI, they don't think that MISNI is the right body, or <clears throat> uh, perhaps this is uh, detrimental to other goals um, that MISNI has, things of that nature. Um, they can also say, hey, let's adopt this, but let's change it a little bit. So maybe it's a little bit clearer, so it doesn't clash with any other uh, position statements that MISNI has, um, <clears throat> or uh, to make it a little bit more actionable. Uh, perhaps. Um, and then uh, the second to last is reaffirmed in lieu of, which means that REFCOM thinks that the existing policy on the books in that um, digest of position statements already covers well enough the resolved clauses that you're submitting. And therefore, we're going to say, hey, let's uh, focus on this policy that's been in place already because one of our members is uh, obviously caring about it. So that's what reaffirming that existing policy is. It's just sort of giving it a little nudge, being like, hey, we should think about this some more. And then the resolved clause uh, is not adopted because we already have one that fits its purposes. And then the, the last option that the uh, reference committee can say is, you know what? we're not so sure about this resolution, this resolved clause. Um, 
you know, we don't know about all the impacts that doing this action could have. Let's refer it to study. And so that gets sent to um, <clears throat> uh, the board of trustees and the council to determine on uh, which folks of MISNI would be the best people to take a, a nice deep look at this study. Uh, MISNI has a bunch of different committees that do this work. And so that committee takes that resolution, they look at it, they do a lot of background research and try to figure out what the possible impacts of that resolved clause could be and uh, whether this is worthy of MISNI's attention and policy. And then that committee will then uh, write a report about it and put in all the references, uh, just like any other sort of study and submit it to uh, the next HOD. And then um, they can have the same recommendations as, as a REFCOM, whether that's adopt, adopt with amendment, or totally rewrite the, the resolved clauses to better fit what the authors are potentially doing. Um, <clears throat> but that will eventually get back to the HOD with some sort of uh, well-researched opinion about it. Any questions about the REFCOM? Great. The REFCOM often happens uh, just a few weeks before the HOD. Um, that's in the virtual setting. Um, as far as I know, I think we're keeping with the virtual REFCOMs. Um, traditionally, before COVID times, the reference committees occurred the day before the HOD meeting. So there are multiple reference committees happening at the same time. Um, and during these reference committee uh, hearings, anyone can talk about the resolution. Um, they take a list of the submitted resolutions and they go by it one by one by one. And anyone can talk about any resolution. So if you see the proposed resolutions and you say, oh, that's a good idea, you can get up and tell the reference committee, hey, I think this is a really good idea. I think MISNI should support this. Um, and then reference committee takes all that different testimony for or against or any recommended changes. And that influences their decision on what their recommendation would be in their final report. Yes, Dr. Parikh. I'm sorry, I think I, I raised my hand by accident. Um, but I think somebody had a question regarding um, whether you know, you're more likely to get something passed if it says support versus advocate for. Oh, um, it really depends on what you're advocating or supporting for. Um, if it's, <clears throat> um, there's a lot of uh, sort of, details that get involved with that. Um, where advocating is normally uh, sort of moving lobbying dollars and support is just kind of, if someone asks us, we'll say, yeah, we support that. Um, so there's, it depends heavily on what the subject matter is, um, how much support there is for that action in the house and the reference committees. Um, so that's a, a little bit difficult to ask, but I say in really broad strokes, uh, it would be easier to support, to pass something that says support instead of advocate. Um, uh, Dr. Dowling, uh, if you may have something in additional to mention on that. Sure, thanks. And I think, I think that you're, you're right. And I think that you know, there's some layers and nuances that become more real when you're looking at a specific resolution, but to give two quick examples. MISNI to seek legislation or regulation to allow physicians to collectively negotiate, um, you know, that would be something clearly most doctors would want to endorse. And by the way, whether they are for a hybrid system or single payer, doctors need to collectively negotiate. I think most of us would agree. If it were something like uh, an area where the specialty society where patients and specialty docs really should take the lead and MISNI doesn't have the bandwidth to take the lead because of our you know, number of members or budget, et cetera, 
having NISNI having a policy of support sometimes is enough. And then staff and doc leadership as, as if it's a bill that's moving along in, in Albany, for example, uh, may, may say, yeah, MISNI supports it, but the specialty does the legwork. And that's exactly how I worked with psychiatry in New York and the psychiatry advocacy team to get a bill passed a few years ago to ban so-called conversion therapy or beating the gay or gender identity out of, uh, out of uh, teens or young adults. Um, you know, uh, MISNI clearly wasn't going to make that one of its major issues to focus on on a legislative day, but having that policy allowed me to speak as a psychiatrist leader and as a leader in MISNI and say both organizations are on board and that opened up the door to more people co-sponsoring that bill. I thank you so much for clarifying what I was getting at. Uh, Dr. Dowling has been a, uh, a long time member of MISNI and extremely supportive of, of the uh, RFS and the NSS um, and great at teaching at all things. Any other questions about reference committee, that sort of language stuff? I know I'm running up on time, so I may go through. I only have a few slides left, I think. OK, great. Um, so that brings us to the meeting itself. So um, over here is the REFCOM recommendation. So as I said, REFCOM will write a report and every single resolution has one of those previous recommendations on it. And if you agree with that recommendation, then you don't do anything at the meeting. Um, if you don't agree with that recommendation and you can say this for a resolution that's yours, that's not yours, that's brought in by someone else, it's any recommendation by any REFCOM, you can get up and say, no, I don't agree with this recommendation. And that's when you extract at that meeting. And when it's close to the meeting, I'm sure your various leadership will explain how the meeting works exactly. I don't wanna get into those details, um, but it'll be extracted at the meeting, meaning that it's talked about at the meeting on the floor of the House of Delegates where all the different representatives of the sections will say something about it before taking a vote. And that's effectively what um, all this right-handed uh, jargon is. And because I wanna keep us on track, I'm gonna speed by that, which means uh, we're up to questions. I think we answered a, a few of them during the presentation. Uh, this is a QR code that links you to a MISNI guide on how to write a resolution. Um, so it brings you to a page that MISNI has developed and within that page is a link to that sample um, <clears throat> resolution uh, so you can just literally download that and type in whatever whereas clauses and resolve clauses you want and it's already in a good format to be submitted so you can check out that qr code um, <clears throat> to get to the guide are there any questions Um, I had a quick question. How many times a year can you submit a resolution? Because this was something I initially didn't know. There are it's only certain times, correct? Yes, that's a great that's a great question. For MISNI, um, we have one HOD per year, so you can only submit the resolution um, prior to that meeting. Uh, the resolution due date for HOD is um, our next HOD is in April. So the resolution due dates are probably gonna be, um, I think early March. Again, the staffers can correct me on the exact details. Um, <clears throat> and that's how it works for MISNI. Um, other societies generally have one meeting as well. So generally it's the submission date is a month or two before their big voting section. Um, the AMA has two HODs a year. Um, so you can submit resolutions twice a year for them. Their meetings are in June and November, and again, uh, a couple months, um, beforehand for those larger organizations as well. Um, I saw Dr. Dowling's hand was up, but he put it down. So I think it was up from before. Any other questions?
if not, then I'll hand it over to Dr. Parikh uh, for our next segment. <laughs> 